Let's begin by standing, if you can, and uh, we've got a responsive reading to call ourselves to worship. Now I'll do the leader part, and then the next slide will have, have your part. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His, his faithfulness continues through all generations. Jesus. Willingly and gladly we surrender our lives with whatever's going on in them right now, whether it's good or bad, happy or sad, fulfilling or discouraging, knowing that you are walking alongside us, whatever it is, through thick and thin, through prosperity and adversity, having been there and done it yourself. 
because you know from your own experience exactly what we're going through. And we take great comfort in knowing that. So we come today to worship you. Here we are to worship. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. 
keep playing on that refrain, Valerie. Those main chords. Let's just I invite invite anyone who wants to just express to the Lord their appreciation for His love. Speak out. and offerings um, I want to say uh, thank you again for uh, your faithfulness your trust in God your obedience to him as he's spoken to you about your support for this church and I know that there are many things that that uh, probably all of us also God is, speaks to us about and that we're supporting financially and so um, we just bless you for following the Lord's leading in your life uh, uh, thank you uh, to those who have been able to kind of increase your tithing as we as we uh, spoke about when we did the financial update. We know that not everyone's able to do that, uh, but we're grateful for those who have been able to. Um, as you notice, the wingman is away today, but um, uh, the power of electronic mobile communication means he is here well he's, he was going to be here in spirit anyway but he's also here digitally <laughs> so uh, he's asked me to read from Luke chapter 3 um, no I forgot to I think this is uh, Jesus speaking no it's John it's a dialogue it's John the Baptist it comes into kind of the middle of it John says, the axe is already at the root of the trees. And so he's speaking to the uh, to collection of people from Palestine who have gathered to uh, uh, see what he's about and what he's up to. So that includes some Pharisees, probably some Sadducees and other leaders of the Sanhedrin, various legal uh, religious leaders and scribes, and then just common folk as well. He says, the axe is already at the root of the trees and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then, the crowd asked. John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none and anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you're required to, he told them. Because, of course, that's what they were doing. They were, uh, the Romans said, we need 10 bucks in the barrel. So he would say to you, the taxpayer, 15, please, and keep the five for himself. So don't collect any more than you're required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, what should we do? And he replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. What a concept. So here's uh, what Wilf has added. John the Baptist has some pretty stern words for those coming to him for baptism of repentance. But the advice he gives to the people is still relevant today. This passage in Luke 3 is a good example when he says anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. When I read this, my mind was drawn, or when I read this, my mind was drawn to the coat rack in our entranceway, which is overloaded with coats and jackets of many styles and weights. Anybody relate? <laughs> I realized that out of all the articles on the rack that belonged to, belonged to me, I use only three, a light jacket, a heavy winter coat, and a rough service kind of work jacket. I can't help feeling a little selfish by not giving the extra coats to others in need. If I give my surplus coats away, three things would immediately happen. One, someone in need would benefit from my act of generosity. Two, 
I would feel better for having been generous. And three, my coat rack wouldn't be so overloaded. <laughs> the third reason may seem inconsequential, but it will serve as a reminder that I can get by with much less than I have now and still be happy. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for placing us in this land of plenty. We ask that we be reminded of our blessings and that you instill in us a greater desire to be generous in all things. We ask that the tithes and offerings returned to you this day will be the beginnings of great things in your kingdom here in the valley and wherever we may be influencing your kingdom abroad. In Jesus' name, amen. So... I often think of what is our Christian fellowship all about? You ever wonder about that? Why, why do you bother to get up this morning and, and uh, get yourself here? And I think it's a fair question. Uh, and it's easy for anyone to say, I, I just as soon not go today. It's effort. Uh, we can say, well, it's about Bible teaching. Well, we can get Bible teaching from our own reading. We can get Bible teaching from reading books. We can get Bible teaching from turning on good church shows Sunday morning. They're all there. So what's so special about coming here? And I would just say it's because it's local. And uh, anyone who speaks on television doesn't know where Vavenby is on the map. And... Um, we're not going, we're not coming together here because you're going to get the, the greatest of musicians. You get good musicians, you get decent singers, I think. And you're not going to come here and get the, the greatest sermon that you've ever heard because those are going on on TV all the time. Better sermons than you're going to get here. But we're here because we live here. We, we live here. We don't own that. We don't appreciate that. <laughs> and so I believe there's power yes. in being here. Yes. Amen. There's power in just showing up. Amen. June. Thanks for sharing that, Sandy, because, see, those are local things we are able to pray about. Yeah. The, the, the big guys, they don't know about your dad. We know about him. And we have local needs here. And so I don't know how often you come to church and go home and say, boy, I didn't know that in the Scriptures. Occasionally, occasionally you say, but that's, Something a new a new idea I'm not familiar with, or a scripture I haven't read for for a long time, and, and I don't think it's about um, the preacher trying to think of something that you'd never heard of before. You've heard of most of this before. It's not very often I'm going to be able to share with something you've never heard of before, because we read out of the same book. We were all are able to read the love letter from heaven to us. And so may we be encouraged that we're sharing information. We are bringing encouragement to each other and reminding ourselves how much the God in heaven loves us. How many times as moms and dads do we tell our children, I love you. Is there one time too many? Or between spouses or between friends? I appreciate you. I, I love you. You're my best friend. You're a good friend. You're a faithful friend. 
So there's nothing wrong with really good repetition. I remember when April was a little girl, <clears throat> and you know, she had her medical issues, and she's always been a bit of a chatterbox. Both my girls are chatterboxes. And she could not go more than it seemed like 10 minutes without saying, I love you, mommy. I love you, mommy. Love you, daddy. And so one could say, well, would I ever tire of that? I don't think so. And I don't think God gets tired of us saying that to him. So today I speak of an agreement that God gave to the world. <clears throat> an agreement that God gave to you and I. And so we start in Romans 5 and verse 6. The Apostle Paul says, For a while we were still helpless. Have you ever felt helpless? While you were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though prefer, or perhaps for a good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. I want to, <clears throat> sometimes I wish that word reconciliation was replaced by another word. We know what it means. But, <clears throat> but it describes getting relationship again. <laughs> So whenever the Bible speaks of reconciled to God, we're being reconciled to God. It means we have been brought back into relationship with him through the death of the Son. That, that's what it's about, being brought back into relationship to him. Therefore, just as a one man, sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all have sinned. <clears throat> so as I mentioned some weeks ago, that we are God's most prized creation. And what's interesting, of all creation that God created, man is the only one that sinned. The plants didn't sin. The trees didn't, the animals did, but man did because man was the only one who had a free choice. <clears throat> and so as, as we had a free choice, we had the choice to make the right decision or the wrong decision whenever we're given the place to have decisions. So because we had a choice, Man, unfortunately, made the wrong choice. So the choice in the Garden of Eden was the wrong choice. It was the wrong decision for Adam and Eve to disobey God and eat from the forbidden fruit. <clears throat> we became enemies. And that is a very hard word for me. Really? Because we ate from a tree we shouldn't have ate, eaten from? We become enemies with God? <clears throat> Thank you, you'll appreciate that. It just seems 
so extraordinary to think of God be my enemy. I mean, how do you feel about that? I can't stand it. But that's what we became. We were enemies and we were helpless in ourselves. We could not do anything about the fact that we have sinned before and currently. And so what could we do that would fix our situation? Nothing. The scripture says we were helpless. A number of times, and I've told you this before, <clears throat> we've found me personally, I have found a lamb, I remember a couple of times particularly up on the mountain range, uh, that had got the sloughs up on the range in various places. There's these sloughs and wet places. And the lamb had fallen in uh, this sloughy place, and it was right almost upside down, just his head was sticking out. And I came across it. Mountain's a big place. It'd be easy to miss it. But I look at this lamb, and it was still alive, but it was completely submerged in this sloughy black muck. And so I was able to pull it out, put it on my shoulders, and walk in to the safety of where the background was, which was probably about a mile away. That lamb had no chance of ever getting out on its own, ever, ever. And of all the other sheep, that were its friends, not one of those sheep could get that lamb out of the pit. It took more than a sheep to protect or to rescue or to fix the problem that that lamb had gotten itself into. It took the shepherd. And so it's the shepherd that can fix us. It's the shepherd that can rescue us. But we got ourselves in a pickle, so to speak, and so we had to let ourselves be vulnerable and allow God to do something for us. And it says, again, God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, while we were in the slough, helpless, much more having now been justified by his blood, we have been saved from the wrath of God through who? Through him. Through Jesus. For while we were still enemies, while we we're still in the pit, so to speak, we went somewhere we shouldn't have. We went into the place where we can't get out without help. We were brought back into relationship with God through the cross of Christ. And so, <clears throat> God made an agreement for us. We can put that illustration up. <clears throat> we call it, I call it a peace treaty, a peace treaty with God. That's the agreement God made with us. He made a deal, gave a deal for us. And if you see the deal up there, God is on one side, and we are on the other side. We can't get across the, the canyon. We can't get across from cliff to cliff. There's no possible way of getting across because we're helpless. But Jesus came the cross is the bridge. The bridge that we walk on from where we are to where God is. And Jesus is what took us there. He gave us this uh, agreement that the cross would take us to the new place. Then that's the offer. The offer, the peace treaty is an offer. Whenever we have to sign a treaty or a contract or an agreement, that's a free choice. Why wouldn't the Ukraine like to have a peace treaty right now? 
but nobody wants to make a peace treaty with them. They're pretty helpless. They need a peace treaty with someone. Now, fortunately, we're not dependent on man for this peace treaty because Jesus has offered a peace treaty with every single one of us that we may receive an ultimate reward, which is eternal life. So as God made this agreement, the peace treaty came to us on that first Christmas day. The agreement we had, the contract, and it was offered to everyone for free. It wasn't binding. The agreement was never, you must do this or else. But if you want relationship with God, you must do this. And there's no other way from one side to the other except through the cross of Jesus. You can't get there by being good. You can't get there by going to church. You can't get there by reading your Bible. You can't get there by any way except accepting the treaty with Jesus cross of Christ and the question is you don't have to get through this life you don't have to skip the deal but to live eternally for the next life you have to accept the deal because that's all there is that's all that's available that that's the only way to God and man can wiggle around look at this look at that argue this, argue that. There must be another way in, but there is no other way in. Only the cross is the way to eternal life and to, to God the Father and to the whole kingdom of heaven that we're going to enjoy. The cost of sin <coughs> always has been enormous. And the cost of worldly sin has caused wars like there's one now. World War II, we look in the history books and realize what an enormous cost that cost the world. For the world <clears throat> to, to see and look around and look at the evil in the world and the man, man that hates man hates each other, so we have war. And so the cost of World War II is <clears throat> one of the larger costs I think we've ever seen, maybe the largest. And so there was a war, and the fight was for freedom. I certainly am not one to enjoy the idea of war. Uh, there's a part of me that feels sometimes seems quite passive. But I have to agree that we probably wouldn't have work, any peace in the world at all if it wasn't for war. To protect our freedoms. And there was a war to protect the freedoms of the Western world. It cost lives, it cost money. And so I would say this, a conflict comes before peace. H how do we get the cross? We have the cross of Christ because of conflict. What was the conflict about Jesus, the Son of God, <clears throat> the Son of Man, who became God, who became man, became flesh and real among us, he lived the perfect life, and yet there was conflict. Even in his perfection, people hated him. And so he laid down his life, and that cross is what gave us the freedom. And so, another cost of sin. And so if conflict comes before peace... And as Jesus went through the conflict with Satan before had come around and all that he did, the fight with Satan was before we had peace with God. 
And so really the only way we could ever become friends with God is through the cross. Peace never has come easily into this world. And it hasn't come easily to get back and gain back the relationship we lost with God in the Garden of Eden. We weren't able to really get it back until the, the Christ, as I mentioned the other week, the other garden, where he was arrested in Gethsemane so many centuries later. I want to remind us the fight with the devil, in a way, has been fought and won. However, we're still in a war until that final trumpet. And I want to remind us something. Sometimes we feel a bit desperate. We, we realize our own vulnerability, our own fight with faith, perhaps. We're not having days of, oh, I can just... <clears throat> the movie Mountains Faith I talked about last week. And we feel kind of gloomy. And we don't maybe feel like a warrior anymore. Well, <clears throat> I want us to be reminded that God is fighting for you, not against you. Sometimes we may feel that... that uh, God is not on your side. You ever feel that? Things haven't gone well for me the last year. You know, this happened and that happened and financial problems and lost my job or got sick or losing some loved ones. You think God's not on my side anymore. Well, that's, that's the war we're in. <laughs> See, that, that's the devil fighting you. That's why we need to fight him back and say, no, Satan, stop lying to me. Ephesians chapter 6 speaks of the armor of God, and Paul says here, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Be, be strong. He didn't say, be weak. He says, be strong. You say, oh, I can't be strong. I feel so weak. You know, when we've decided, you know, we decide, oh, I'm not going to eat dessert. And then dessert comes, oh, I feel so weak. <laughs> you, you know it. I mean, that's small potatoes, what we're talking about. <clears throat> be strong. He's calling us to have strength of how? Of his might. You say, I don't have any might in me. I don't have any strength in me. It doesn't matter. He's the strong one. Amen. It's his might that we put into our life and get strengthened. And it goes on. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For a struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God, so that you will be able to resist in the evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Because there's been a peace agreement does not mean that we can just float to heaven. God has called us to faithfulness. Faithfulness is part of the battle. Because the devil doesn't want you faithful. He wants to steal your faith. He wants to steal your victory. What's the best way to do it? To lie. He, he lies to us. <clears throat> when Satan is around, he's always lying to us. See, there was, I, I talk of this because, as I said, there's no peace till, till, till the fight's over. Peace is on the other side of victory. We have to go through things. <clears throat> there's, there was no peace in Europe until the war had ended. 
There's no peace in the sheep flock until the wolf has been taken down. The devil has to be taken out whenever he shows his ugly head. And he shows up pretty often. And the, we, the more room we give him, the more he's going to show his head and the more he's going to work on us. And so that's why we say to him, we send him pack and we send him where he's supposed to go. I think of uh, uh, Matthew chapter 4. I'm not going to turn to it, but you know the, the, the account when Jesus was led into the wilderness by the devil, by the way. And he went out into the wilderness and Satan tempted him three times that we know of. And after Jesus had rebuked him the third time, <clears throat> what did he, how did Jesus end it? He ended it by saying, Satan, get behind me, depending on your translation. Or Satan, be gone. He commanded Satan to leave. <clears throat> then he left. You and I have been given that authority by him. Now, <clears throat> I'm not saying you have to do this. But when I'm, I don't do this when I'm around people very much or at all. <clears throat> but when, the de when I'm having a struggle, I like to go for a walk, or sometimes I'm out already out when I have the struggle. I, f I, s I hear the and see the, what, what Satan's trying to do to me. And, and so what I do, I, I yell at him. That's just in case he's hard of hearing, you know? So sometimes I yell and scream, and I tell him to go to hell where he belongs because he didn't belong in my life. I've told you that hundreds of times probably, dozens of times. I'm just saying that's what works for me. And I, I don't think Satan is hard of hearing, but <clears throat> I think we need to tell him out loud. Don't just think it, but actually speak it out loud. You can do that in morning breakfast prayer uh, with your spouse or with your family. You've done wrong with, but if you're going to really yell loud and crack the windows, maybe you should Go for a drive. I don't know. But, <clears throat> but tell him where to go and keep him out of your life. He's got no business. And got to, we have to stop talking to him. And so this goes on even though we have a peace treaty. Because we want to keep the peace. We do that by obeying what the word of God says. I'll just quickly close with the last part of that, of that passage. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and we've read this tons of time, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And so that's what we do. We clothe ourselves with the armor of God and we will be protected. We can't feel safe going out into the battlefield with no protection. <clears throat> so we give glory and honor and praise to our Lord. And so we're speaking about stuff we already know, but doesn't it help to be reminded of who our captain is, who our general is. We follow his commands. The commands are in the scripture. And by putting these protective things over our life, we become protected from the evil one. So it becomes the time of the Lord's Supper. Isaac, I'll call you to help us. And so let's take our, our put ourselves before him this morning as we partake of the bread and the cup and be reminded that we have victory because of the cross of Christ. <clears throat> uh, let's pray. Lord God, you are a loving God and a jealous God of us, and you are a good, 
God. You're a powerful one. You are the only one, Lord. And it is hard for us to follow you properly. We trip, we fall, we sometimes deliberately walk in the opposite direction on which we are supposed to. Um, but we ask God for your forgiveness and guidance that you will continue to press on our hearts, press on our minds to turn around and keep walking in your direction. We're going to make mistakes, that is for sure, but we ask, Lord, that we will just seek one thing, and that would be the truth, not a truth that we would like to believe in, but the truth itself. Lord, may we seek you. May we seek you above all else. In Jesus' name, Lord, amen. All your 
your sorrow and your sadness. This is Savior and He calls. Bring it all to the table. Father, we just declare once again this morning that we love you. We receive the love you have for us. Thank you. Lord, bless your church here in the valley. You know our needs before we ask them, but we're called to remind you of our needs. So we just bring them before you, Father. You, you've talked to some of them today. We have health needs, financial needs encouragement to our discouraged hearts from time to time. Become Holy Father. You are our deliverer. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being our Savior. Prosper us for the week. We pray safety and blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Shane is uh, on schedule to bring the message next Sunday if everything works out okay. Look forward to that, and may God bless you today. Uh, my love to you, and have a happy, safe week. Thank you. Savior.